Hi, and once again, I'm here with Okiba Jabala, a noted artist, a multimedia entrepreneur, who's now doing a show called The Dirty Dozen Jim Crow Fantasies. Sounds like an exacting or exotic, mm -hmm. provocative name. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Jim Crow yeah. Fantasies. Yeah, and it was the fantasy of believing that the civil rights movement had a certain impact, that it did not. And unfortunately, it's... um. We're really good at saying, hey, I'm here, I'm good, so it worked. But when, if you line up 10 of us and only one of us is at a certain place, then it didn't work. You know what I mean? So that's the um, failure. And, I, and, and I'm just, it's, it's pretty much like you're building an airplane while you're flying it. So it's not me pointing the finger saying, ha ha, that didn't work. It's me being on the other end because now this generation in front of me, they're trusting for me to make the right plays so they can make the right plays. So there's a big disconnect from that generation because I can't pick up the phone with the majority of that generation to say, hey, this is what I'm doing. So there's a disconnect to that Jim Crow fantasies that it was really about being able to separate us in a whole different way that makes it impossible for us to work together. As you're speaking of generations, you wanted to do this next Georgia Power show about your art exhibit on February 17th, but you sure. wanted to do it here at Clark and University yeah. to speak in front of students. Students right. are here. Why? Because it's important for these uh, students to see me in live time and to see us in live time because otherwise it does absolutely no good to read about me on this site or this magazine. That doesn't do any good. If you can't see me smell me, I can't see you smell you, it's, it's not worth it. So I wanted to bring it to Clark and Lane and I want to bring it to every HBCU so they can see it in live time, live action, instead of seeing it on a computer screen. And you think, in a sense, this is a piece of art in itself? Oh yeah, it's definitely. This is um, a combination between performance art, combination between spoken word, the written word. It's, it's a combination of things happening right now, but it's all true and it's all pure. You know what I mean? So none of my words are scripted. I'm not faking it, I'm not doing, this is what it is. If anything, certain things are toned down. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? If anything. But your work is not turned down. The art no. you created, 12 pieces in the Jim Crow Fantasies series, uh -huh. is more than provocative. Oh yeah, yeah, it's definitely that thing. It's, um, it's that thing to, to, to really open you up. Because unfortunately in this scene, you have zoo lions, and then you have that Serengeti lion. And my work is that Serengeti. You know what I mean? Where Explain it's not, that. Basically with a zoo lion, the zoo lion's thought process is, I know the zookeeper. And the zookeeper is going to be at a museum, it's going to be at a National Black Arts Festival, it's going to be at a high museum, it's going to be all these institutions who want black art to be this nice, tranquil, no teeth, Tom Ford dressing lion that's just laying in the corner. You know what I'm saying? So that line, in comparison to the line that's on that set, those two different lines. Serengeti line. Yeah, that Serengeti line. Yeah, yeah. So you take that line and you put him or her in an art gallery, it's a whole different ballgame. So either you're going to run for your life or you're going to be consumed. Those are your only two options. That zoo lion's sleeping over there. They ain't worried about it because it represents a safe black art for them. You know what I mean? That they can control and they can put their thumb on. So your black, your art, your black art is not safe. It's no, dynamic. It's, it's uh, intriguing. It's uh, yeah. threatening. The truth has to be threatening. You know what I mean? You can't have you know safe and truth in the same. It doesn't work like that for black folks. You know what I mean? So it has to be honest. And anything that's honest is a threat to the establishment. Maya Angelou was quoted saying once, the truth is a stubborn fact. Oh yeah. Your art reflects the facts of where we are, who we're about? Yeah, definitely. I mean, it speaks to the reality of the black experience and not just my personal experience, but because I think that's a part of the problem. Part of the problem is we get a handful of black folks who get a handful of nickels in a certain place and then all of a sudden that's not my issue. No, my art speaks to our issue. So I can separate myself from it, even though I'm in it. So even by separating myself from it, I can create it, be honest, and when I walk into the gallery, I can walk in there and see it as if it's not mine. And, and your, your art lives and breathes and it's consuming. You have big pieces, don't you? Oh yeah, yeah, I do volume. You know, like um, big pieces from eight feet by 10 feet to five feet by four, some smaller, you know what I mean? But I need room, black experience. Our experience needs room. There's not, nothing you can just squeeze into a little, we, I, we need some elbow room. And you use 
unconventional material to create. I mean, it's not just a nice painting, is it? No, nah, no, nah, I use a lot of things. I'm from um, South Carolina and Mississippi. And my father, well, my grandfather, rather, was a um, blacksmith, cowboy, sharecropper. So I grew up. Oh, that's what I was Your grandpa was a good cowboy. Yeah, yeah. So it's that far. That's, it's, it's that far, but my pops was a hustler out in New York. So I have those two different temperaments in me. And the materials that I saw my grandfather using, that stuff spoke to me. And also looking at how ingenious it is for black people to be able to take certain things that we would normally walk by and never use and everything. So I look at that as my supply for my arts. And tell a story through that. Yeah, yeah, because um, that's a great story. Part. Yeah, the story is important. And initially, my plan was to be a college professor, Pan African Studies. And then when the economy fell apart in 07, 08, I had to shift gears and everything. So I could <coughs> sit in school for another three, four years just to go teach somebody. You know what I mean? So I said, okay, this art can be that platform to be able to still do what I need to do. And you've always been an artist of some sort. It started yeah. early on, didn't you? Yeah, I've been an artist my whole life and everything. So from being a kid on up to being a grown man, it's just I'm the first person in my family to actually turn it into a profession and, to, and make money off of it. Making money, that's something else I've heard you articulate that um, black artists mm -hmm. get ripped off, don't get paid. Oh, yeah, 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 that's that's a common. You heard the, st the starving artists. Yeah, here. yeah, and that's a lot of that's because a lot of black artists have really a really low business IQ and everything. So they create their work from this emotional place instead of from a logical business place. And, and when you're doing business, you need to be in your business mindset. And also at the same time, that's their only play. So if that's your only play, you might have a drought. You might sell 20 grand, 30 grand, but it might be three years before you sell some more. Because especially if you're in a climate like Atlanta, Atlanta isn't saturated with art collectors. You know what I'm saying? It's, it's saturated with weed collectors, rim collectors. You know what I'm saying? Going to a restaurant, popping bottle collectors is saturated with that. But the culture of art is in Atlanta. So, and it, art is a very expensive game too. So if I need to ship some paintings to California to show, that's a rich man's game. That's not a poor man's game. So a lot of artists become starving because it benefits the establishment to keep you starving. Hmm. And benefits art galleries to not have to pay you, right? Right. And it's quite a few. And, and so your business thing is you, you show your own art. You don't go through galleries. Yeah, yeah. I mean, this is um, the situation I'm doing now. We're doing a partnership, Correct. but the majority of the time, nine times out of ten, I always produce my own shows from top to bottom, and I have my own list of collectors, my own relationships. I have all of that, but when looking to uh, diversify my group, then I'm going to go ahead and jump and say, okay, I like what he or she is saying, so let's see what we can do at the west side. But the majority of the time, it's my own production from top to bottom, because if I don't sell anything, that's up to me. But even when you're a dealer, you can tell, like if you're the artist, I can say, okay, so-and-so wants to get this piece for 10 grand. And I'm telling them 20. Right. So they get to 20 because there's no relationship between you and the collector. Right. So they say 20, he tell you 10, he give you five, he leave with 15. That's how the game is. That's how the game is. Yeah. But you, so you, so when you're painting, is business in your mind as you're creating? Is, is your creativity also mm -hmm. business oriented? Yeah, business is in my mind before I get started. You know what I mean? So once I get started on the actual work, then I go ahead and apply what I have to apply. But even the strategy of making 12 pieces is about business because art is a luxury item. You know what I mean? So it, it being a luxury item, nobody wants to walk into a studio and see hundreds of pieces everywhere. That's not luxury, especially if I'm, I'm creating the African-American luxury version of it. Then that's like having, you know, that's, that's a different game. So you got to spin, you have to put a spin on it. And you have to brand yourself too. Though. Yeah, yeah. You have to because if you don't brand yourself, people like to look at what they like to look at. You know what I mean? So what I mean by that is if I came in here as a dirty, starving, hungry artist, nobody would hear me. My talent would be what it's supposed to be, but they wouldn't want to hear me. You know what I mean? Because then they would play you. But if you're coming in, you're dressed as well, you speak as well, you're eating as well, <laughs> it's going to make people shift and move. So when people say Okiba Jabalo, what, what, what does that mean as an artist? What, is, what do your, your collectors, your fans say about you and your work? It's a combination of, um, I think some people say I'm real, real blunt. I'm real, real right at it. Some people say you're an asshole. 
You know what I'm saying? <laughs> and that's strictly because of the truth. You know, it's not, and I don't mince words. Some people say, um, it's what you see is what you get. So I'm not gonna tell you something, then run back and go do something else just because I was trying to tell you something to make it look a certain way. I really don't care. You know what I'm saying? Like, when I say care, I don't care about trying to impress people. You know what I'm saying? It's just, I market what I market, but I'm not changing who I am in order to fit into anything. But you don't paint to sell. I mean, you don't create with a profit motive in mind. You create what your spirit tells you? No, I do both. No, I do. You know what I mean? So the business of it says, okay, we're going to do this to sell because I'm in the business of art. You know what I mean? And also understanding there's a market for everything if you market it right. I got you. you know what I mean? So like even like as black as my work is, and we got Tyler Perry, we got Oprah, we got Will Smith, we got Denzel's. I have quite a few athletes and actors who've already bought my work. You know what I mean? So there are other artists out here who are more popular than me, but ask who are they popular with? I'm popular with the people who actually buy top dollar art. Right. I'm not popular with the general public who just wants to, you know what I'm saying? Have some on the wall. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not the poster popular. That's not my... My lane is saying, okay, if I'm going to do this, I'm going to be the black Tom Ford of what I do with this black art, as black as it is. You know what I mean? I'm not doing the other thing. And yours doesn't come cheap, does it? Nah, nah, nah. Because people don't respect cheap. You know what I'm saying? Like, if you do cheap, they play you like that. Play you cheap. You know what I'm saying? People idolize and, and drool over the Bugatti. They don't idolize over the Honda. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So my thing is, let's get this black Bugatti going and make no apologies about it. That's what it is. Give us a sense of what uh, a typical piece of yours might cost for the, for the students here. Um, I can say a paper piece like that eight and a half by 11 that's on your notebook might cost you about two grand just for a sheet of paper. And that's just like a base charcoal drawing, you know what I'm saying, that's base. Bigger pieces run you 20, 25, 30 grand. And that's, that's, and that's low on the black end. You know what I'm saying? So we think about like, oh, that's a lot of money. Man, white boys out there getting that thing for 200 grand, 300 grand. You know what I'm saying? So there's a for, disconnect. For one, really? For one piece? Yeah. Yeah. Julian Schnabel, man, it's a lot of white boys out there getting that bread. You know what I'm saying? Like, getting it. Cause that, that is the business of art. Yeah, that's the business of art. So unfortunately, with the black, like we have um, Thornton Dow, who recently passed, who um, he's able to get high numbers now, but he did in the ground. You know what I'm saying? He was getting numbers like right before. Ro you know Romare right? Bearden wasn't making that kind of money to nah, the point. Nah, until after. Until after. So it's a bad business model. They want you to die, get in the ground, and then give you some bread. And then you won't even get it. You won't even get it. So my thing is now, nah, we're going to get mine right here, right now. You know what I'm saying? I ain't waiting. I need mine right now. <laughs> you know, so that's what it is. Yeah, but, you, but you talk about, you're not just an artist. Mm -hmm. uh, you're a multimedia kind of multi-platform kind of guy. Yeah. I mean, you produce what I do. I mean, yeah. um, so how is it you can create art but still be a businessman and with magazines and uh, other shows as well? I mean, you, you, you're that multifaceted or you have to be, you think? I'm, you have to be, but I'm like that by nature. So creativity is my thing, not just art. You know, so I can take anything and make anything out of anything. You know, so, so when looking at the magazine, looking at advertising, marketing. A big part of me starting my magazine is that I didn't want to pay another magazine to get my word out. Mm -hmm. So I was just like, why? Because I, I was doing it. I bought one ad at a, um, Simply Buckhead. Pay like $1,200 for a half a page ad. And I was just like, man, I can produce my own magazine, trademark and all for 500 So why am I going to pay them this every, every issue? It makes no sense. And nothing is in there that speaks to me. I needed information, you know what I'm saying? I needed to know how do we set up these businesses? And also I use that as a tool to recruit new clients and everything and also showcase my old clients or current clients. Again, we're on the campus of Clark Atlanta University. We're talking to journalism students. Mm -hmm. And this is a media and society class. Right. Are you telling young people they have to be multifaceted, a multimedia sort of entrepreneurs as well? Yeah, yeah, I encourage everybody that's in here. I need for you to be able to get at least three to five paychecks from three to five different people every month. Don't lock on to just one person thinking, oh, it's good right here. Now get a check from everybody, everybody. If you're great at what you're great at, I need for you to be good at two other things <laughs> and get a check behind that. 
because you're going to have those moments. You're going to have those moments like the, the paintings can be bumping, the graphic design can be bumping. I have a number of other products that's in the wings. I'm also a musician, you know what I mean? I record label and that whole deal. So, you know, there are a number of different things that I encourage y'all to be able to get that money like ASAP, five different ways. There's an art in that as well, isn't there? Yeah, yeah, it's definitely. It's so there's definitely. art in life. Yeah, yeah. It's just the creativity. You know what I mean? So don't don't put your creativity in a box and say I'm only a sculptor, I'm only a painter, I'm only a writer, I'm only. Creativity doesn't care how you apply it. You know what I'm saying? Creativity can fit in a bottle. It can fit in a box. It can fit in a room. It can fit in the back seat of a car. Creativity can go anywhere when you adjust your thinking. Why do I want to turn Friday, February 17th for Jim Crow Fantasies? Why do I want to be? Why, why would they, mm -hmm. me, why would we want to be there? No, yeah, because there's nothing else in Atlanta as live as the work that I'm giving you. And we're also doing a two-day event. Mm -hmm. Saturday, we partnered up with the Village Market, and that's going to be on Saturday, so we have live performances, poetry, music. But Friday is the opening reception where y'all can put on a little something, something, come on out here. You know, Saturday, it's that urban community feel. It's in the same venue and everything. It's just two different. Nice rooms. venue, too. Great oh, venue. Yeah, yeah, the venue is top notch and everything. So the reason why you should be there is because we're changing time. You know what I mean? So this would be one of those things where y'all look and say, oh, yeah, that was so and so and so and so in my class. You know what I'm saying? This, I am that dude. And I'm not apologetic or shy about, yeah, I'm that dude. You know what I'm saying? So. So, and I welcome, and it's not just, just me is saying, I'm that dude, but y'all that dudes and dudettes. You know what I mean? So, yeah, I'm, I, I put 20 years in this. So, yeah, there's some talent out here, but they ain't no keeper. Ain't no keeper. Nah, So ain't what no do you want us to leave there thinking, saying, feeling, once we see your work? Just, see your work. just the truth and honesty. And then we'll have some conversations. We'll even do an artist talk and invite the students down to the gallery so we can go ahead and do it, because it's easy to have this conversation now. Well, we're going to take everybody, put them in the gallery, and then we're going to have that conversation again so you can have the work around you, you know, so we can have context. This is probably uh, one of the most unique and dynamic people in Atlanta. His name is Okiba Jabala. He's an artist, a uh, multimedia entrepreneur. He's also my friend. We're on the campus of Clark Atlanta University. I'm Maynard Eaton, and you've been listening to Georgia Park. Please join us on February 17th and 18th, 2017, for Transcendence, a celebration of African-American artistry and entrepreneurship at the Westside Cultural Arts Center at 760 10th Street, Northwest Atlanta, GA. Our two-day event begins on February 17th with a solo fine art exhibition featuring renowned multidisciplinary artist Okiba Jabal, and that's from 6 p.m. to 10 p.m. On Saturday, February 18th, from 5 p.m. to 10 p.m., join us for the Village Market, a showcase of over 30 entrepreneurs. We're also featuring a live performance from Emmy-nominated spoken word poet, Mr. John Good. To RSVP for Akiba Jabalo's Fine Art Opening on Friday, February 17th, and to purchase tickets for the Village Market on Saturday, February 18th, please do so at www.ezrsvp.net.